Hi Notboard Gamers and welcome back to Notboard Gaming. I'm your host, I'm Mark. Now in today's video, I'm going to be reviewing from a solo perspective the latest core set for Dark Souls the board game. And this is Dark Souls the board game, The Sunless City. Uh, now this is a core set, it's a standalone core set. You do not need the original Dark Souls board game to play this core set. There are other couple of core sets out there, but this is the latest one that incorporates all the, uh, the final, uh, the, the rules changes, etc., which I'll talk about in a second. I think they're called Tomb of the Giants and the Painted World of Aria Miss or something like that. But Dark Souls The Sunless City is the latest core set. And as I say, you don't need the original game. This is a standalone game that you can play, but you can also potentially mix and match some of the monsters and some of the encounters from this with some of the other core sets that you can get. So therefore you can expand your uh, your gameplay experience. Now, this is a review copy that was provided to me by Steamforge Games, but I will be giving my, my honest thoughts at the back end of the video. So what is um, Dark Souls, uh, the board game, The Sunless City? Well, <laughs> if you know about Dark Souls, the board game, uh, it came out from Steamforged a few years ago. Yes, there was problems with the Kickstarter and then there was issues with some card errors and, and the rules didn't quite gel for a lot of people, but it absolutely has its core players and people have got like everything for it and they absolutely adore the game. And it's obviously based on the really successful video game. The kind of first... Uh, of these Souls-like video games, as they're, they're called, where you're expected to repeatedly die in the game to progress, and that is a key part of this as well, is your progression is sometimes going to be reliant on your death. Now, what do you get in the Dark Souls, uh, the Sunless City? Well, first of all, you get three heroes in this, or three, uh, yeah, three heroes, let's call them. You get a warrior, you get a pyromancer, and you get a herald. There are obviously other heroes within the core sets and within the base game, but that's what you get here. You get three heroes and you get a number of different kind of uh, individual bad guys. Oops, these are all in the uh, in the carton just yet, to fight against on your various encounters. And then there is a mini and a main boss. So the mini boss is called the Titanite Demon. And you can see that there, that rather big miniature there for the Titanite Demon. And that's their particular card. And that is the mini boss that you're gonna fight kind of halfway through. And then the aim of the game is to get to the main boss which is or Ornstein and Small. I think that's pronounced correct. So here we go, it's Ornstein and Small. That's these guys here. Uh, and you're gonna fight them as the main bosses at the end of the game. They operate very differently to how the kind of smaller uh, smaller foes uh, have, uh, uh, operate. Uh, you also get this encounter board here, or this, uh, this campaign board, because in reality, what they want you to do is play through the full game, if you like. I mean, it's very easy to put down, but play through the full game, upgrading your character, beating all the various encounters and the mini boss, get to the main boss, and that's it, you beat the game. So you get the encounter board, you get some, uh, some item cards, you get encounter cards, sorry, uh, you get event cards now as well, that you get to pull at the end of a at the end of when you've done a successful encounter, and you get a number of these player boards as well uh, in the game. There's obviously lots of tokens and other minis and other cards like weapon cards, etc. But that's what you get. And as I said, the aim of the game over a number of encounters: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten encounters, including the two mini bosses. Um, is to get through that ent entire uh, campaign to defeat the main bosses, but. As in the board, as in the video game, you are going to die, and dying is not only an important part, it's an integral part, if you like, of going back to the camp and using the souls that you collected to upgrade your character, to get new items, uh, and to therefore then have the ability to become stronger and re and go back through uh, the encounters. And that's a key part of it as well: is you're going to have to replay some of the encounters. Now they have introduced uh, a mechanism which is kind of stepping stones things here, uh, which means that if you get an encounter, you complete it, you can put, uh, and it says to put one of these uh, these tokens on it, you can skip it the next turn, so you don't have to replay all of them. But pretty much like the video game, you're going to go back to the bonfire when you die, upgrade your character, and then carry on through it. So it does have an element of grind to it that is integral to the game and to the board game as well. So well, that's kind of an overview of the game. It's a, uh, a dungeon crawly, skirmish type game, uh, where the aim of the game is obviously to get through everything and beat them all and upgrade your characters along the way. Let me take you down to the table and show you a little bit about the components, what's there and how the game plays, then we'll come back and discuss my final thoughts on the game. Mm -hmm. 
So here we can see I've got everything set up for a game of Dark Souls, uh, the board game, The Sunless City. Now set up, once you know what you're doing, is very, very easy. The storage is pretty good in the, uh, uh, in the box. And to set it up, it takes around about five minutes, which is very good for a game like this, because normally with a dungeon crawler game, you set up a million different decks, etc. And you're not here, you set up a few decks uh, and some encounter cards uh, and your characters, and that's really about it. So it takes around about five minutes to set up the game. So what we'll do is we'll talk about the individual characters I'll just take you down to my pyromancer here. I've got the pyromancer and the warrior, but we'll take it down for the pyromancer and I'll uh, talk about uh, how the pyromancer works. So here we have the board for the pyromancer. Let me just show you the figure of the pyromancer. That's uh, this, this particular figure just here. The hero figures are brown, all the other figures are grey. Um, but yeah, you can uh, obviously you can paint them as you want. So here on the board you've got the pyromancer and you have their various stats going along here. You have their base stats, then you have tier 1, tier 2 and tier 3. Those stats are important. Let me just pull this up and show you. Those stats are important because when you're pulling certain items out, uh, weapons out, you will need a particular score on these as you're upgrading your weapons to be able to handle that weapon or that item, etc. So those are really, really important. Uh, the uh, strength, dexterity, intelligence, and faith. Over on the left-hand side, you have their, uh, their kind of special ability, their hero ability here. This is explosive firepower. So it says this character's next m attack with the magic symbol gains an additional black die when they roll. Here at the top, you're going to put some various tokens on here. You have um, their look token, which I believe is this one, which allows you to re-roll. Um, you have their Estus flask, which is this one here, which allows you to um, kind of top up your health. And you have this one here, which is called Heroic the... Action. Sorry, so that's the heroic action that allows you to take that. Look allows you to re-roll. Estus flask allows you to re-top your health up. And if you can get any embers here, uh, if you suffer that three or more damage with a single attack, reduce that damage by one. Um, so you'll pick ember tokens up throughout the game. You don't start with an ember token. And on the uh, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the board are where you're going to put your items. So you have armor, you have left and right hand for two weapons or a weapon and a shield or one two-handed weapon uh, and then back up these are things that you can carry uh, in your in your kind of backpack and you can switch out your weapons along the bottom here you have these cutouts here because this is where you're going to track your stamina and your damage in there so when you take a turn chances are it's going to cost you some stamina when it costs you stamina you fill that up there you do get to recover three stamina at the beginning of every turn uh, if those two ever meet and you need to place one more that's it your character dies and you go back to the bonfire and start again so let's just talk you through the various kind of uh, cards that are here as well. We'll start off with the Pyromancer's armor, uh, starting armor here, and they all get starting equipment and they get to upgrade it, and they do get their own bespoke upgrade equipment as well that you may get. Uh, so it says here that it only needs an intelligence of 12 to wield this, to have this armor, and the Pyromancer starts on 14, so we know that is worthy of their starting. This here is there, uh, that's their shield there. So if that had a figure on it, I think the paramount has got one. There we go. You'd roll a blue die when it comes to kind of uh, uh, defending yourself against enemies, etc. You'd roll a blue die, uh, one blue die, because it's got number one on there, and that would give you some, uh, some abilities to... Um, uh, to defend yourself. This is kind of, uh, this one here with this um, uh, with this swirl around it is magic. This is your magic defense. The Paramount is obviously a magic person. They've got two defense here. This one is their dodge capability. So you would roll one dodge die and try and get a dodge off the back end of that. Uh, and here is the upgrade ability. This one cannot be upgraded. Certain items can be upgraded. Here we've got a spell for the Paramancer. It's the Paramancy Flame. Uh, and you can see here as an attack, it's not a defensive thing, but as an attack, if you spend zero stamina, you do one magic attack. Or you would roll one black die for a magic attack. However, if you spend four stamina, you could roll two black dice for a magic attack and that would affect everybody on the node and we'll talk about nodes when we get there we already talked about shield there there's one block on the shield and no rolls and that is kind of their starting equipment there is a fourth one for the pyromancer they've got this uh this hack this uh, hand axe over there uh, i choose to start with the pyromancer's flame uh, the armor and the shield, and I keep that one in reserve. And that's the player boards. Each one is asymmetrical and works slightly different. When it comes to upgrading, what you would do is uh, you would spend your souls and you would upgrade. There is a table that tells you how many souls you need to spend. You would literally pop that out, 
turn it over to its gold side and put it back in there. So you're popping out a piece of cardboard, putting it back in. If it's the gold side that's up, then you've achieved the uh, the upgrade on that particular thing. You know which weapons you can go for. We'll talk more about my thoughts on this and on this in a little bit. Not my favourite part of the game, this, these little cardboard tokens. Um, uh, I kind of wish they'd used... Um, they had used wooden cubes instead. So that's the pyromancer there. This is the, the kind of aggro token. So when you take a turn, you're going to take this. That can affect the bad guys uh, coming at you. So that's the uh, the board. I say each board is slightly asymmetrical. These are the dice that you get to roll. They're all colored. So black dice, blue die, green die for dodging, and an orange die as well. They increase in power with the colors that you get on there as well. And these are the little tokens that you would use there. Double-sided tokens, stamina, and health. And you will put those on that board. And as I say, when they meet, you need to add another one. The character would die. So let's go over to the main board itself now. As you can imagine, Dark Souls is a game about various encounters. And throughout your campaign, you're going to be uh, pulling out uh, different encounters to kind of fight the bad guys and increase your powers till you get to the mini boss and the main boss. These encounters are graded. You have one, two, and three. And along the bottom here tells you what you put. So the first three are uh, the first encounter or number one encounters. The next uh, one, uh, two, three, not including the uh, the mini boss, are number two encounters, and then the final two are number three, the hardest encounters. Then you face the uh, the end boss. You get a number of these tiles. These can be display. You can use any tile, whatever you want, for using. Some of the encounters will ask you to use two of the tiles, uh, but you don't reveal a tile until you step onto it. Generally, there may be some game changing effects that that, that kind of uh, that change that. We'll talk about the encounter cards in a second. We'll come on to these. Uh, these item cards so you get a big shuffled a big deck of item cards that you're going to shuffle and these are effectively your uh, uh, your weapons and items that you can get to upgrade so let's let's have a look here uh, so this is the halberd you would need 18 strength and 13 faith to be able to handle this so you need to have upgraded from that but you can see it gets to roll a blue die plus one or a blue die uh, two blue die plus one uh, if you spend one stamina or four stamina and it's got two upgrade slots on there so some of the items you get will be upgrades so we have as you can see as we go through this there are a lot of item cards there'll be some individual uh, character item cards in there and then other item cards so <laughs> kind of getting as met through as many of those and getting them in your inventory is really really important Important. Next, we have the event cards, and you're going to pull. Generally, pull out one of these out when you complete a, a, an encounter. You're going to one of the actions that you will do at the end of that is to pull out an event card. But some of them may ask you to pull out an additional event card, and these can be these are split into various things. There are instant ones. There are character specific ones. Uh, sorry, not character. There are ones that re require timing, etc. So if you look here, um, I've got what's called the life gem here. And this says, during the next encounter, this character heals one damage at the start of each of their turns. And at the end of the next encounter, discard this card. Uh, and then if you look at some others here, we got this Firekeeper's Boon. Okay. So there we go, the Firekeeper's Boon. Uh, choose a character and that character can upgrade a stat without spending souls. You see, when you kill bad guys, generally what's going to happen in complete an encounter, uh, you kill the bad guys, you're going to get souls. And souls are what you spend to upgrade, uh, to get new items for your characters. So you can get them from, say, the item board and the event cards can do slightly different things with you there. Next, we have your uh, your kind of fire counters this is your overall health you start with four sparks every time you go back to the fire that's going to reduce by one basically when it's down at zero that's it that's game over as i mentioned going back is a key part as well of the game you have to go back uh, at some point to start upgrading your character you can't get the weapons for, or the items from your inventory unless you go back to the fire so getting that is important here is your campaign token that's going to move on to which encounter you move on and obviously when you go back to the fire you go there and then i say you're going to put different encounters at the bottom of each of these chances are when you go back to the fire unless you've got like a stepping stone that allows you to skip it you're going to have to replay some of those encounters now when we talk about the bad guys the game comes with, as apart from the mini and main bosses, it comes with a number of bad guys as well. So you have the Silver Knight Swordsman, and this tells you how they operate. So at the beginning of their turn, they are going to move two towards their closest player. That symbol means closest. 
Uh, then they're going to push the player and attack four, five, the closest player, and also uh, they will attack. They will also deal that damage to anybody else on the node as well. And you would need to have uh, two dodge to uh, successfully dodge this. We have the sentinel here. Um, oh, let, I'll tell you what else. This is their resistance here. So the one on the left is their kind of physical melee, uh, their physical resistance. The one on the right is their magic resistance. So of course, the more that you need to get for that, then the better, or the more you can get against that, the better. That's their health. Some of them seem low, uh, but how they move and how you have to interact with them means that you know sometimes getting that one can be quite difficult. We have a sentinel here. Uh, you can see that these are a little bit stronger. They've got 10 health. They move forward one, they push the closest player and then they're going to do six damage to the closest player and anybody on there and you need a dodge result of one or above we have the silver knight great bowman uh, so they are going to do four damage against the person who's got the aggro token and anybody else on that node then they're going to move back one uh, away from the um away from the person who's got the aggro token then we have the crossbow holler they're going to move back one first from the person who's got the aggro token and do three magic damage to the person that's got the aggro token then we have the Mimic. So the Mimic comes out in this game. Uh, let me show you the Mimic Mini. Here we go. So if you played Dark Souls, the board game, you'll know of the Mimic. There we go. That's the Mimic Mini. And there's various ways that can come onto the board. They're going to move forward two towards the person who's got the aggro token, push them, do six physical damage against the person who's got the aggro token, one physical resistance, one magic resistance, and a health of five. We have a Hollow Soldier. Move forward towards the closest player one, then do damage of four towards the closest player with a health of one. And a Silver Knight Swordsman, move two towards the closest player, push them, damage five that closest player and anyone else on their node. I think we've already done that one. So yeah, so that's kind of the, the all the bad guys that come in the game apart from the, um, uh, the mini and the main bosses. And all of your encounters are going to be made up of various forms of them. There are extra tokens if it asks you to put more on the board and you don't have enough, so there are tokens for each of those. But there are also things like traps that can go on the board as well. I think the final thing to show you are the encounter cards. Now these are different to the main board game because these um, uh, these uh, kind of give you rewards and give you an additional kind of trial that you can complete as well. And it tells you what goes on there. And what you're gonna do for each encounter, you're gonna pull out two cards, you're going to choose one. Uh, so let's say we choose this one, which is the Age Sentinel. Over here, it tells you where to place them. So on the, on the board themselves, you're not really able to see it, but there are different icons on the board and it tells you what to place there. So that, that looks like it's going to be the Sentinel that you're going to place on that one. Uh, and then there are some purple spaces. And it's going to ask you to place, I think it's two barrels maybe that, or it could be two gravestones on there. And it tells you where you're going to place your characters. Then it gives you an objective. And the objective here is to kill the Sentinel. Okay, then the rewards for doing that, you get three souls times, sorry, the number of players times three souls. I'm playing with two characters, that means I would get five souls, and I get to draw a treasure, so that's great, I get a treasure or an item. And then it, uh, it gives some special rules, so for the trial, and trial is an optional thing, you can flip both gravestones, so they are gravestones, to the diminished side, and the sentinel skips its starting turn, uh, and then the, reduce the sentinel's starting health, uh, and it's attack damage values by minus two. So you're on the first encounter, it's gonna reduce that down for you. And here we go, a trial, you will search and you will get an ember basically. So you get that for completing. You have to do that, you can do the trial, completely up to you. Let me show you a level three one, I'll show you how different they change, okay? So here we go. We got a level three one here, yeah? So we got hanging rafters. It says it's a two room. On the first room, you're gonna place uh, these two characters on that particular icon, that character on that icon, two barrels and some traps as well. It's gonna ask you to place traps. Then in the second room, you're gonna do this. So the reward here is to re reach the exit node. It's gonna tell you where the exit node is. The souls is the number of uh, players there are plus six. So you could get eight for doing that. Draw two event cards and you would get uh, from uh, some dark wood and the grain ring from the treasure <laughs> from the uh, from the treasure there, so you'd search through that. Special rules on the trial: you'd have to kill number of players plus three enemies. An onslaught. Reduce the node model limit to two. On the nodes on the map, there's generally three. It's going to ask you to reduce it to two. And if a character is pushed by an enemy attack, they suffer uh, whatever that is. I think that's a damage there. And if a character is pushed, they're also pushed towards the closest trap token. So it's going to try and push you onto the trap tokens. You can see the marked difference there between uh, the first encounters and the second encounters. So 
that's kind of how those work. The, as I mentioned, the uh, the bad guys work from a deck of cards, or the, the mini and the main bosses work from the deck of cards. So if we look at the Titanite Demon, they've got a, uh, it, here we go, it tells you when you're attacking them what you've got to do to kill the Titanite Demon and what the rewards are and what the special rules are there. The Titanite Demon starts with a health of 22. They get their own dial, which is here, okay? And they start off with some of their cards as well, but not all of their cards, because some of their cards have what's called a heat symbol on there, and you would add those into the deck, or you'd add one of those into the deck when they reach half health, okay? Uh, and Titanite Construct, here we go, this is one. If the Titanite Demon suffers three or more damage from one attack roll, reduce the damage by one. There we go, so that's the overall thing for the Titanite Demon. And you can see we have the cards without the heat token, without the heat symbol, and then we have the cards with the heat symbol. And what you're gonna do, as I say, you're gonna shuffle one of those cards when it gets to half health, put it in there, and you are going to try and battle them now when you play against the main bosses you have your kind of uh, hand limit of whatever it says maybe four cards basically and you when you work through those that deck once you've gone through it once you don't shuffle it it happens again in the same order until it gets to having the heat card and that means you get to learn its pattern and that's really important the pattern will be slightly different each game, but you get to learn it for the first half, and then you get to learn it for the second half, and that allows you to then potentially come up with a strategy to beat it. But chances are, if you get to that Titanite Demon too soon, you're going to get defeated fairly, fairly quickly. So, what we'll do, that's kind of a brief overview on how it works. There's other rules, but things about, like, when you get treasure tokens, how the Mimic comes out, etc. But that's kind of a general overview. So, I'll just take you down, do a couple of turns, and then we'll talk about my final thoughts. Okay, so here we are, we're going to start the game. The first thing we're going to do is uh, move our encounter token down to here, or our group token down to here, our party token, and we can see it's down here, it's a number one encounter. We're going to draw two encounters and choose one of those. So let's have a look. We have Tempting Moor, which is one room, or Illusionary Doorway, which is two rooms. Now, generally I may, would, may well start with going for something slightly harder because the rewards tend to be a little bit better but here they're not too bad so you get to draw two treasures quite happy with the tempting more so that's what we're going to do it tells me where to put things here so there are say there are various icons on the board and but it does tell me my enemy types so if I look at my enemy cards which are here it tells me that I am going to need let's get this right this icon and this icon and this icon and yeah, so, okay. So we're going to need a bowman. Sorry, it's two soldiers, so you get that. We're going to need a bowman, so a hollow bowman. And we're also going to need a silver knight great bowman as well. So there we go. And I know from what it says on here, I am going to need two hollow, uh, two hollow bowmen, one hollow swordsman, and one silver knight great bowman. So first of all, we look at the this particular symbol here, and that appears on the map where, oh, that's the bad guy board, that's, there we go, that's better. So this appears here, okay? So the first symbol is a single sword, and that's this one just here. And on there, I'm going to place a silver knight bowman, there we go, and also a hollow swordsman as well. So that goes on that particular symbol. The next symbol says I'm gonna place a hollow swordsman and a hollow bowman where it has two swords. So there we go. So we'll place that on there and that on there, okay? It also tells me I'm going to place a treasure token on one of the purple ones, okay? And this is the purple one that is like a cross. So it's this one up here. I think it's like a cross over there. Yeah, it's uh, not like a cross, it's that there. So I'm going to place a treasure token there. So there's the, the chest token, sorry, not the treasure token. Now, generally what would happen when you get a treasure chest, uh, a chest token like this, you have these cards here and you would shuffle them and you would draw out a card to find out what is in there, okay? So here we go, oh, there we go. It tells you what's in there is not bad if it's got this little glowing symbol on there. However, if you pull out this card, that means the Mimic is going to come on the map. So it randomizes how the Mimic comes onto the map. Now this encounter has a special rule. So let's go into the special rules. 
And it says here, if a character opens the treasure chest, instead of drawing a card from the treasure deck, react, uh, sorry, reset the timer and replace the chest token with the mimic model. And why reset the timer? Well, this is your timer along here. So you would use that timer to kind of, every time one of your characters takes turns, you'd move that timer up. I haven't put the token on there, but I will in a second. Why is that important? Because you have to kill all enemies in number of players plus three turns, so I have five turns to kill all en enemies. The mimic does not count as an enemy if the chest hasn't been opened. So whatever's on the board, I have to kill in five turns. And the rewards are two uh, number of players plus two souls. And if I complete the trial about killing the mimic, I get number of players plus two souls again, plus I get to draw two, two, two treasure. That's why the timer would reset. So let me put the timer onto the board. So we'll put that there and I'll just get the timer token. <coughs> okay. And that's on the board just there. So the final thing to do before we start and put our players in the starting area is have a look at the bad guys that we've got, okay? And you can see at the top, they have this uh, initiative number up here. So you're gonna put, sort them in initiative and this is the order they are going to go into. So we'll put those there. It's gonna be the Hollow Soldier first, then the Silver Knight, Great Bowman, and then um, the Crossbow Hollow. They go first, then one of my characters goes, then they go again, then one of my characters goes, and that's how the game works. So let's just zoom into the board now, and a little bit more, and we'll place our characters on. So let's place Pyromancer there, you up there, and we're ready to start the game. Say so attack and defense is gonna be in the form of dice here. So I have to kill these in, uh, in five turns basically and also if I want to do the trial I have to get a mimic and kill the mimic within another five turns or whenever that resets so I don't want to step onto that too early because the, the board would be crowded with things so let's move these guys first so the first up is a hollow soldier so we have two hollow soldiers they're going to move one towards the closest uh, the closest uh, enemy here. So we can see this hollow soldier is going to move directly onto my node and this one is going to move there. It, actually, yeah, yeah, we can move there or there. Can't quite get to the pyromancer just yet, but can get here. Now they're going to attack and the hollow soldier is going to attack and they are going to issue for damage to that closest soldier. So how do I defend against that? Well, the, the closest soldier that we have is my warrior here we go and let's have a look at the warriors cards and see what they're going to roll in defense okay so they have a round shield which is going to give them one black die as a defense they also have because it's uh, physical damage not magic they have northern armor which is given two black die uh, and their battle axes does nothing in defense but the important thing is on the northern armor is you get to roll a dodge die. Now in the original game, you could choose between blocking and dodging. Here, you can do both. So they're gonna attack me for four, and I'm gonna try and mitigate that as much as possible by rolling two black die and a dodge die. If I roll a successful dodge symbol, I can dodge and I can uh, miss that attack completely. I can spend a stamina to move a node as well. So let's roll my two black die, one, two, and my dodge die and see what happens here. Well, look at that. The dodge has happened, okay? So I would have only blocked one of that four damage, so I would have taken three had that dodge not happened, but the dodge has happened, so therefore I'm safe from that attack. I could spend a stamina and roll, but to be honest with you, I'm quite happy where I am just there because I can attack him on the next turn. This one doesn't attack because he's not within range now, so now we move on to the next one, which is the Great, uh, the great Knight Bowman, basically. So they are going to attack, and as you can imagine, Imagine from a melee perspective, sorry, from a range perspective, they can attack from wherever on the board, basically. And they're going to attack for four, the person with the aggro token. None of my players have gone first, but I've chosen that the Pyromancer has actually got the aggro token, um, which may do me not so good there. So they're going to turn around and they're going to attack me for four. So let's have a look at the Pyromancer's uh, cards here and see what they get to do in terms of... Um, in terms of their defense. So we can see the Pyromancy Flame has got nothing on there, so they don't get any dice for that. The Hand Axe has got nothing on there, they're attacking items, oops. The, uh, just drop the card. The uh, Cordsius Round Shield has got one blue uh, die on there, so it gets to roll a blue die, which is stronger than black. 
uh, and the Paramancer Garb has got one dodge on there. So they are going to get to roll <laughs> one blue die. Uh, and uh, their dodge die, so this may not work so, so great for them. Well, they don't have to get the Andax because that was in their backup equipment anyway. So let's roll a blue die and a dodge die for the Pyromancer. Uh, so the great silver, great silver Swordsman attacks first and then retreats. So one second. Oh, we got a dodge and we got three there anyway. So had they not got that dodge, what would have happened is that they would have uh, defended three uh, against them, so they've only taken one damage, which is good. They've got the dodge. Do I want to spend uh, a stamina to move? Mm, not at this stage. No, I don't. No, I don't. So we're not going to spend a stamina to move just yet. I'm still okay with that. Now, the second part of their action, they're going to move away one node away from the person with the aggro token. Finally, we have the crossbow hollow. It's their turn. Okay, and uh, we can see that they are going to attack the person with the aggro token. Uh, uh, sorry, they're going to move one away and then attack the person with the aggro token for three magic, uh, three magic damage here. So they're currently here. They're going to move there one away, which is fine. And then they're going to attack me for three. Well, they're going to attack the Paramancer because he's got the aggro token. What magic damage, uh, what magic do they have? Well, here we go. We've got a two magic damage on that. That's his second symbol and still their dodge die. And that's it. So they're going to roll two black die and a dodge die and let's see if it's taking a hit ah, they've dodged again so we're okay so they've done their bit that is the bad guy's turn on here now now we're going to go over to my turn uh, so we'll move that marker up to one uh, and who do we want to go first well let's see we are going to choose the pyromancer first i think so on your turn, there are various things that you can go through for your turn. It sounds like a lot, but in reality, they act fairly quickly. The first thing is the upkeep phase. You recover three stamina. Let me move my uh, Pyromancer's board up here so we can see that. You recover three stamina. Well, um, oh, you can't see that yet. I don't have, I've not spent any stamina yet. So we don't have any stamina to recover. So there's no stamina to recover. Then I gain the aggro token, which we know we've already started with. So there we go. And then the character can stop swap out any number of items from their backup uh, into their hands, basically. So I could change that for that if I wanted to. In reality, I actually, um, yeah, neither of those, uh, it doesn't really make a difference for what I want to do. So we're okay at the moment. Then each other character can move one node and this is a new rule. So you can move one node on another player's turn. Uh, do I want to move? No, I'm going to stay where I am for this because I want to attack that uh, Hollow Swordman when it comes to the Warrior's turn. So that's that. And then we've got the action phase. So you can move and take an action in your phase. You can move one node for free. So I could move to there for free. If I want to move additional nodes, I have to spend a stamina to do that for each node that you move to. But remember, stamina <laughs> starts to clog up your board, just like hits do, basically. So in reality, you know, uh, if you can get away without running, sometimes it's best not to. But sometimes you absolutely need to to complete objectives. So I'm, uh, I could move. I don't want to. They could move on my turn. They don't want to. Then I want to take uh, an action and I want to attack. So I look at what I want to do. And I've got this kind of magic attack, which is a ranged attack, basically. That means I can throw that anywhere on the board at anybody on the board. If I look at this, I could spend four stamina and roll two black dice and that would uh, attack, that would give me a greater chance of attack of anybody uh, on that board uh, and also it would attack anybody on the node. But I could also uh, spend this token here to use my master power here. And the character's next attack with this symbol gains an additional one dice. Well, let's have a look at this hollow swordsman, this great hollow swordsman. He's over here and he, um, uh, sorry, the silver knight great bowman. He's over here and he's quite aggressive. He's gonna do kind of four damage there. Uh, the hollow soldier's there. So I'm actually gonna attack this guy here and I am going to use my master action. Probably wouldn't this early in the game in a real game. I'll flip that token over, I'm going to use that. And I'm going to spend four stamina. So we would do one, oops, one, two, three, four. I flip that and I get to do this, which means I know from my pyromancer here, I'm going to get to roll three black die against them. Okay. And if we look at the silver knight bowman, they've got zero magical damage. 
So I've got a really good chance of defeating him here. I say in reality, I probably wouldn't use this because it'd be wasted on this particular character. Let's roll this. There we go. I've done five damage. That is off the board. Perfect. Excellent. So that is my attack done. How is that character done? What would happen next is these would go again and they would start attacking me and then I would move over to the warrior, move the aggro token over to them, to the warrior. They would take their turn until the room is finished and then you would get the rewards. As I mentioned, there's also the thing on this about that treasure deck that when you step on that, the Mimic is going to come out and the Mimic is a lot harder to kill. But if you can do the main objective and the trial, you get additional rewards in the terms of souls, in the terms of items that you can get from the treasure deck, etc., which give you more that you can upgrade with. And therefore, when you go over to the campfire and you visit the armorer or you visit the person that allows you to uh, upgrade your skills, then you have more to do with this. So there's a real benefit in completing the trials as well as the main objectives. That's it, that's how the game plays. As I mentioned, the main bosses and the mini bosses work off a slightly different deck of cards to how these work, but you can see the gameplay is now very streamlined and really, really fast. Yes, it's dice dependent, but it's really fast, really streamlined, and the action is intense. Okay, so let's go back to my final thoughts now. Okay, so as you can see, it's a fast and frenetic board game uh, where the action is intense and it kind of moves quickly from one scenario to the next. When you go back to your fire and you spend your spark, that's when you get to upgrade your equipment as long as you hit the relevant kind of uh, 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 marks on your various uh, strength, dexterity, intelligence and faith, etc. Upgrade your equipment, anything that you've taken from this treasure uh, deck here. There are also the events that you pull out at the end of an encounter and sometimes you pull out two of those as well. This deck can be quite big, so therefore you're going to have to go through a certain amount of milling to get the items that you want, uh, which means that those trials become even more important. You're not just doing one main objective, but you want to do the trials as well. And that's where the jeopardy comes, because you're kind of pushing your luck a little bit, because you know you may be able to complete a room, but you really want the trial, but the trial is going to offer something far more challenging for you to do, but the rewards are better for you. And creating that kind of dichotomy, that kind of choice that you have to make is a really interesting thing. And I think that's where these revised uh, encounter cards work really, really well uh, in the fact that they give you numerous or a couple of options, should I say, to complete, or you know, one of them is optional, uh, to complete the encounter and get that trial, get that bonus, and try and maximize working through that deck and get into the items that you want. But to do that, you still got to upgrade your character, which means going back to the fire, which means that the you died from uh, Dark Souls uh, is very prevalent in this because dying is not only kind of uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to happen in your game. It's, it's, sometimes it's a key requirement uh, and you've got to choose when you're going to go back as well, uh, which you can do. You can go back to the fire at your own time, but you know, you've got to choose and potentially choose a harder encounter so it sends you back so that you're ready for it the next time. So the first time you play through that encounter, you get to understand what's there and what you need to beef yourself up to get there. Then you'll work your way back through to that encounter and hopefully you'll beat it. And chances are in your first few games, you're going to get to the Titanite Demon and you're going to get your book kicked quite severely. So, yeah, fast, frenetic, lots of uh, streamlined mechanisms in this. I think the additional things that they put in the game are from the revised rules. And I don't have the full list because I've never played the original game. But the ability to dodge and block at the same time. The ability to move on your when another player players taking their, their turn is really important. That allows you to get around the map and get that tactical advantage that you so rightly need as well there. Uh, as I mentioned, you've got the tokens for upgrading and then yeah, you've got the bosses that you're going to fight. The campaign structure, you, you know, the campaign map is nice and easy. It's a little board that you follow and flow all the way through. So there's lots here to like about the game that I really enjoy playing. And when I uh, when I first got this, I was like unsure because I knew that, you know, Dark Souls had got a bit of a checkered past in terms of the board game, but it really does have a very strong community out there that love the game, that have painted the minis, that got all the expansions for it. So I was a little bit trepidatious about it. I'd heard a lot about the grind as well. 
And the grind is there. It's inescapable. You cannot get away from the grind in this game. So that you've got to take that into consideration when you're thinking about buying Dark Souls, the Sunless City, or any Dark Souls game, is how are you are you prepared to work with that grind? Because when you die, you're going to go back to those first encounters and play all the way through to the point you died and then hopefully beyond that as well. <sighs> I don't mind it because that's kind of the video game, but I can absolutely understand that, that grind is not going to be for everybody to replay an encounter. And some of them, if you're really beefed up enough, you will just wipe through so quickly uh, that you know it's uh, you know it, it almost feels like pointless playing it basically. So you you know you, you may take a couple of hits and or a hit and that's it. Um, so you've got to be completely aware of that grind. You can't get away from it. You could work the system. You could go back and play a different encounter, but then you're not really working within the balance of the game. If you want to do that, that's absolutely fine. You play the game your own way. But I like going back. That grind does not bother me as much as I thought it would, um, which, you know, and I completely understand if it's not for you, it's not for you. And this is not to say it's the right or right thing or wrong, but for me personally, it didn't really bother me that much. So yeah, it is a rock hard game as well. Certainly as you're playing it for your first few times, you're not going to get anywhere near the, the main bosses. And then on the occasions that you do probably your first time, <coughs> excuse me, chances are again, you're going to get your butt kicked there. So it's a game that invests in repeated playing, understanding what you need to do, where you need to go back and visit the fire, how often you need to upgrade, what skills you need to upgrade, what's the best build your characters can be to get there. And it demands that repeated playing. That's where that grind structure turns in. It kind of takes away some of the uh, additional thought that you may need in terms of playing a different encounter because you're replaying encounters that you already know how they work and you've hopefully optimised what's going to go on from there. So, Lots of things I like about the game. There are, however, some things that I don't like about the game. Let's talk about these player boards, okay? So, uh, the player boards, in the original one, they had the numbers there and then a hole for wooden cubes in a, you know, in an effort to bring the cost down and, you know, kudos to Steamforge for doing that. They've given these little tokens that you punch out and you flip over. Uh, and the problem is, is they're so easy to lose, basically. So if you lose one of those tokens, <laughs> You're a little bit scuppered because the only way to find out what numbers you need to uh, that you should be at is basically to go back into the rule book and have a look at the table that's in there. You needed to have the numbers next to the relevant one, and you know, wooden cubes wouldn't have cost the the earth. It might have added a few quid on per each one, but yeah, I really don't like these. Same with this uh, this along here where you're adding uh, health and stamina and then taking it away. Um, you're adding these again, these tiny little. Uh, these tiny little cover punch out markers to it. There we go. With stamina on one side and health on the other side. You put them in there uh, and then you're flipping them out again. In my first game, my elbow stuck to some. It went all over the room. It took me ages to find them. So yeah, I, I don't like the player mats. I'm going to admit, I think that um, the game deserves better player mats. And if you've got the original Dark Souls game, then you'll know that the player mats are better because they use the wooden cubes in there. Um, so yeah, that is kind of, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a downer on the game. The other thing to consider is the price and the integration with some of the other Dark Souls stuff. So from what I know, from what I think I know, this is integrate. This can be integrated in a way with um, the other two core sets, but it can't really necessarily be integrated with the original board game because of how the encounter cards work. And that means that for your 90 quid, whatever you're spending on each core set, you know, you're still going to be playing it again over and over with the same uh, same bad guys and the same monsters. Now, if you've got other core sets, you can mix that have got the right encounter cards in there. You can mix those encounter cards in, but what that won't do is give you different baddies from different core sets in the same encounter. Your encounter will either be, you know, fully from the Sunless City or fully from the Tomb of Annihilation or whatever it's called, and uh, the Painted Tomb or whatever it's called, Painted Ariumus, uh, etc. You can't mix and match those in, which is a bit of a shame because what you're going to have to do to get the most out of it is get more core sets. Now, at a, kind of 90 pounds each, it's a, it's a big investment. I think when the original board game cost around about 120 quid, I know it's got its issues, it cost around about 120 quid with more bosses, more uh, more bad guys, more heroes, etc. Then you're feeling like, you know, the price is, is, is kind of pushing it a little bit for what you're going to get out of this. However, however, I really like this game far more than I thought I would. You know, I was interested in it from a curiosity perspective, 
but the quick setup time, the relatively quick kind of play time per encounter, yes, they get longer the further you go on, but the relatively quick play time per encounter uh, and the quick kind of tear down time and putting away means that I can, I know that if I've got a couple of hours to spend, I can set this up, play through an entire campaign and put it away within, I don't know, maybe I don't know, 90 minutes, something like that, 90 minutes and a couple of hours, or even if I don't have that time, I can play uh, a few encounters, I can store it away, get it back out next time, and it's dead easy to store it away in that way and do it there. But you are restricted to playing with the same bad guys and the same uh, 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 the, the same bosses and the same bad guys. And for £90, I think I wanted a bit more variability and uh, uh, attraction in that. But putting all of that to one side, um, I, I really enjoyed my time, I say, a lot more with Dark Souls, the board game, than I thought I would. I think it's a streamlined system now. I think the system works. I have some issues with the UI and issues with the integration with the other uh, with the other sets of it. Uh, maybe over time that will develop as well. Um, but yeah, so do I recommend Dark Souls uh, board game, The Sunless City? Yes, I do, but with caveats. And those caveats are... You have to understand that grind that it's there. You have to understand to get the most out of it that you're going to have to potentially get other core sets as well because ultimately replaying this over and over again will become stale. It is quick, it is fast, it is frenetic, it is fun, but there are some caveats there that just may prevent you from buying uh, Dark Souls The Sunless City. However, if it appeals to you, and you like the look of it, and you want this, this streamlined game, and you want the new rules, and you want the new encounter cards, and you like the IP, and you like the idea of kind of progressing your characters over a number of encounters and doing different builds with them and, and, and going through these, uh, these treasure decks to get more and get better items, then by all means, you're going to have a great and fun time with Dark Souls, The Sunless City from Steamforge Games. So there we go. That's my review of Dark Souls, The Sunless City from Steamforge Games. Recommended with caveats and make sure that you know those caveats before delving into this. Me, myself, I think I want to go out now and buy those other core sets and I want to expand my Dark Souls uh, playing experience because I'm really having a lot of fun with it. But I absolutely understand that this will not be for everybody and certainly with an element of large element of mitigable dice chucking, that is not for everybody as well. So thank you very much for joining me on this journey of Dark Souls, the board game, The Sunless City from Steamforge Games. I believe it's getting out to backers and to retailers right about now, so it should be available soon. Uh, if it looks of interest to you, then go and check it out. Thank you very much. My name's Mark. This is Not Board Gaming. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Check out our other videos. And one final thought, if you can't find anyone else to play with, then there's nothing wrong with playing with yourselves. Until next time, bye-bye.